But part of being here today is not looking away. Trying to not look away. And when I think about the, the world's position or where we are today, I, I, and when I was thinking about this event, I started thinking about these three old guys. You may know some of their names. Joseph Black, 1754, in his lab, messing around with calcium carbonate and a couple of other elements, figures out that if with the right combination, a certain gas is created. And with that gas, no plant life, no animal life, nothing can live if exposed to it. A few years later, and if you think about it, it's kind of remarkable that it's such a short span of time. 1776, a rather auspicious year for some of us, Adam Smith writes a book called The Wealth of Nations. The Wealth of Nations becomes what today is fundamentally the framing document for modern industrial age capitalism. And there's one phrase in The Wealth of Nations, or a few, few words actually, that most sum up where we are today, and that phrase is the invisible hand. That market forces, that capitalism itself, unabated and unregulated by anyone, propels the world forward in a positive way. The invisible hand is a favorite phrase of right-wing economists, libertarians, others that argue that the markets should be completely unregulated and that they will sort themselves out. Finally, we have John Barber, sporting a handsome set of facial hair. John is credited with inventing the very first internal combustion engine. That engine was meant to propel horse-drawn carriages, but make them go farther, faster. And when he invented this engine, interestingly, he called it the exploder. These three guys, their inventions, their theories, have propelled us toward what we today call the American dream. These three things together, carbon, capitalism, and combustion, have propelled the greatest growth in, in, in wealth in the history of the world. But that wealth has come at a terrifying cost. People don't love talking about things like parts per million of CO2 because it's complicated, but just in May at the Mauna Loa Observatory in Hawaii, Scientists for the first time recorded us north of 415 parts per million of CO2. That is a level of CO2 in our atmosphere that humanity has never seen. In fact, they believe that that is a level not seen in 800 million years when there is virtually no mammal life on the planet. So those three guys and the American dream that they have propelled through their theories and their inventions have both given us something really incredible, but they've also given us something a little scary. Because at 415 parts per million of CO2, extreme weather events, droughts, famines, fires, hurricanes are the new normal. But you know, we don't, we don't really want to talk about that because we're living this dream. And frankly, life is pretty good in that dream for most of us. Life is what we thought it was supposed to be. We're, our lives are supposed to be kind of better than our parents, and things are supposed to be easy. And let's face it, it's nice. It's nice, especially born in this country. It's nice. Plenty of us struggle in this country, but let's face it, the people in this room, our lives are pretty good. The dream is what we here were told it is supposed to be. And it's propelled by fossil fuels. Sometimes I wonder, whose dream was it? You know, you, you hear about people say, like, I'm living the dream. That's like sort of a funny phrase. 
But whose dream is it? And, and, and maybe occasionally we think maybe something's wrong with it a little bit. You know, we're electing people that embody the dream, but do they really? And what about their lives embodies the dream? Is it gold-plated coffee tables and toilets? And is that the dream we want? And is hyper-consumption, hyper-consumerism, aided and abetted by social media, with our friends telling us every single day how they're living the dream? Is that our definition of what a dream should be? Well, I don't know, because it's great, right? I, I know that maybe there's something out there that's not right with it, but I'm, I'm going with it, right? And it's amazing. I can get on an airplane, I can go to Tulum, get there by the afternoon, party on the beach, think deep thoughts with 100 or 200 of my friends over dinner, offer a few niceties about how it be, would be good to clean up the beach at some point. But this dream is, is good, and, and, and w most of us are pretty happy to have it, although while it's over here, we have this dream, we're loving it, at the same time we have a sinking feeling that there might be something else out there which could only be described as a nightmare. And in that nightmare, there's a monster. And we think about, well, what is a monster exactly? You know, historically, what have we thought of as monsters? Who are they? What do they, what do they mean for us? What place do they have in our psychology? What place do they have in our, in our literature, in our art, in our history? What exactly is a monster? But, you know, we don't want to talk about it. We, I, we don't want to hear about it. It's a downer. It sucks to hear about this monster. It's a buzzkill. It's not fun. You know, on the beach in Tulum, it's not fun to talk about the monster. Trust me, I'm the guy always talking about it. It doesn't jive well with the vibe. You know, it doesn't show well on Instagram, but we have a sense that it's there, and, and, and this is me too. I have a sense that it's there, but I don't really want to look at it, right? I don't really want to think about it because it's too hard. It's too sad. It's scary, and it's in the background, but we don't want to see it until it comes to my town. It came to my town in the form of walls of fire hundreds of feet high, propelled by wind speeds of 70 miles an hour. It came to my town in the form of firefighters not even showing up because there was nothing they could do. It came to my town in the form of dozens and dozens of my friends and their families losing everything. It came to the, my town in the form of my wife and our son jumping into their car to flee along with 250,000 other people who couldn't escape because there was no plan to accommodate that escape. It came to my town in the, the form of a, of a neighborhood called Seminole Springs that's about 15 miles from here. You can drive over there if you want. Half of it's gone. It looks like a nuclear bomb went off there. It's coming to other people's towns in a much more serious way. Right now, millions of people are starving and are at risk of starvation due to the climate emergency. Right now. So, I guess for me, 
if there's a choice between the dream and staying in it and living it, or waking up from that dream, I've made the choice to wake up. I want to see it. I want to grieve for it. I want to grieve for what it's taking for my kids. And I want to know that for me, in my own imperfect life, as flawed as all of our lives are, I've done what I can to use my time and my resources to try to address it. I guess for me, I want to see the monster. I want to look it in its eye. I want to understand it. I want to feel it in all of its horror and all of the terror it brings. And I want to do every single thing I can to fight it with everything I have. <laughs> We got trouble. Hold on. This is sort of an apocalyptic landscape right now. We're trying to reach Malibu by boat. It's, it's been fucking absolutely nuts in here. Everything from fires to trying to help people just get ice or gas or holding down areas to hearing crazy stories. Everything that's charred comes up the perimeter of the school. We're in a bad spot. We're in a really bad spot. Dad, back! Let's go! Get behind the fucking house, Dad! Seminole Springs looks like off Canaan. They are really going to need your help. It's snowing ash. And everything you're looking at has been burned. Every last bit of it. 